Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today we have Charles Hugh Smith, author, leading global finance blogger, and philosopher, America's philosopher, we call him. He's, he's the author of nine books on our economy and society, including A Radically Beneficial World, Automation, Technology, and Creating Jobs for All, Resistance Revolution, Liberation, A Model for Positive Change, and The Nearly Free University in the Emerging Economy. His blog of twominds.com has logged over 55 million page views and is number seven on CNBC's top alternative finance sites. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Richard. It's always a pleasure. Great. And today's topic uh, is socialism. What is driving the majority of millennials to that? Uh, so we want to explore, you know, what, what's behind that, that trend, uh, especially in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, you know, what, what, uh, what is socialism? Um, misconceptions on socialism. Uh, we'll look at different models, like the, the Nordic model. The, how does that look, uh, positives and negatives? And just uh, in general, also how uh, this could lead uh, to increasing levels of political instability and even political violence uh, in, in the coming months. Right. And it's a great topic, Richard, because... Um, we, we all know that the uh, younger generations, uh, the millennials in particular, are um, uh, publicly attracted to socialism as a more just uh, system than what they see as unbridled capitalism, which, um, in, it, uh, which in its current you know, iteration has uh, created extremes of inequality and opportunity. And so I thought we'd just start by laying out the three different uh, sort of flavors of socialism or what's commonly called socialism. In classical socialism, um, then that means that the state, the government actually owns um, the means of production. In other words, the factories and, and um, and the resources are owned by the a democratically controlled uh, or structured government, so that the rewards or the, and the benefits from the means of production are then distributed uh, relatively equally amongst the population. But in uh, today's world, um, most young people, according to polls, understand socialism not by the classical um, ownership of the means of production, but by social welfare. In other words, the government collects taxes and it distributes it uh, in, in some sort of fair fashion to the, the entire populace. And so I call that like the social welfare uh, version of, of, of socialism. And in the Nordic model, uh, the Scandinavian countries, which are often called socialist, but as, as you'll um, explain in a moment, that's technically not really true. But what they do have is they have a, a model of, of, of um, deep cooperation between, pub, uh, between unions, you know, labor, um, big corporations, and the government. And so there's, a, there's sort of a cultural social contract there that, um, that uh, creates a more equal society because um, the wealthy pay very high taxes and there's a lot of social welfare programs and also programs to create jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think the millennials are coming to this from the social justice perspective. So they sort of focus on that first and then they branch out into uh, economics areas in terms of like socialism. Would you agree? Right. Exactly. That, that, um, that, how do you achieve economic justice? And they're looking to socialism as the answer. But, you know, let's start with the Nordic model because it's widely understood to be successful in these relatively small countries. And, and just, you know, I, I think Denmark has less than 6 million people, which makes it smaller than the inner counties of the San Francisco Bay Area and considerably less than the, the county of LA. And I think Sweden is around 13 million people, something like that, which puts it on par with the county of Los Angeles. So these are really small uh, nations in terms of their population. And, um, and so it's a lot easier for them to, 
to have a unifying culture than it is to have a, a, a very large multicultural nation like Brazil or the United States. But having said that, you mentioned a quote from the um, Prime Minister of, of Denmark, which I thought was really insightful about you know, the, the Nordic model of socialism. Yes, exactly. The Prime Minister of Denmark recently said, Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. And yeah, just, just to uh, uh, further elaborate on that, the, the Nordic countries uh, do not generally interfere with free markets. So they're promoting free markets, they're promoting free trade, uh, global trade, uh, globalization, and uh, generally do not nationalize industries, do not subsidize favored industries, uh, which is a common misconception. Right. And I think they, um, another common misconception is that they just give away a lot of free money to everybody. Um, but in actual fact, um, and I, uh, they have very strong work ethic. In other words, a lot of their social welfare programs are aimed at retraining people and helping um, small businesses emerge and, and, uh, and hire people. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're really focused more on, on, creating jobs than giving free money away. And so that's why um, universal basic income, which a lot of people feel is the sort of socialist solution. In the Nordic countries, they're not really big fans of, of just giving away free money with no strings attached. They, they, they want to help people um, gain livelihoods. That, that's really their, their cultural focus. And, you know, I, we were having a conversation about the cultural aspects of the Nordic model and, before we started recording, I, I'd like, uh, it'd be great if you could elaborate on, on that, uh, that topic. Yeah, the first question I usually ask uh, when people make reference to that is, have they been there before? Um, and then I, I mentioned I've been to Sweden, I've been to Norway. And what I have observed um, in the nature of the people generally the, in the culture is a very strong sense of fiscal responsibility and a high level of education, uh, making very efficient use of, um, of government resources. And, um, and even in the buildings they stay, generally not uh, looking to build brand new government offices, but, but, uh, but working in, in very uh, frugally uh, uh, meager type of facilities, government offices, or old buildings perhaps, um, and making the funds of the government go much farther in terms of uh, very efficiently. Uh, that, I think, would be very difficult um, in North America, uh, given a lot of the politicians are more concerned on uh, getting themselves more lavish pensions. Right. I think you're absolutely right. And I had a chart um, that I w flabbergasted me, actually, that um, in, in the state of California, where I live part-time, um, the, the taxpayer's contribution to um, the public union um, pension plans there uh, was less than a billion dollars uh, in the early 2000s. And now it's um, something like 45 billion. So um, the, the uh, people kind of promoting social welfare versions of, of, of socialism, um, they're, they're not attuned to the fact that it, um, socialism lends itself, if you have the wrong cultural traits, to cronyism and exploitation of the state rather than, as you say, a, a fiscally prudent use of state funds to help everyone. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that leads us, I think, to Venezuela, which uh, pursued uh, – as policy, both a classical form of socialism, meaning that they uh, nationalized uh, a lot of the industries um, in that country, the oil industry and so on. And they also instituted uh, very broad uh, social welfare programs. And so, um, but as we all know, the, uh, the Venezuelan uh, policies of the government have led to a complete collapse of their currency. It's trading at something like 300,000 or to the, to, to $1 or, might even be three million to one now. I'm not sure, but they've impoverished uh, literally everyone in the country except those um, high officials and cronies who escaped and 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 took their money to Miami uh, before the currency collapsed. So that that's socialism in in one version of it. And then we really have to ask, what did Venezuela do wrong? 
because they they pursued socialism as as most people understand it. Yeah, exactly, and um, that uh, contrasts uh, big with between them and the and the Nordic uh, countries in in terms of their approach and what has resulted. Right, and that um, government ownership of of uh, the the means of production um, doesn't guarantee you any efficiency. And um, if a, the enterprise, whether it's owned by the government or owned by private parties, it still has to create a profit. It still has to use, be efficient. Um, otherwise, it just becomes a, a source of losses and it'll take down who, whoever owns it. So, um, you know, Venezuela, it, it, uh, I've never been there, but I have, uh, you know, sources there. I have contacts there. And it, it seems pretty apparent that... Um, the, the government owned uh, infrastructure and resources were very poorly managed, you know, that they were under, uh, under capitalized, you know, under investment and, um, and cronyism has run wild there. And so um, that raises the question for millennials. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you make sure that the, the, the socialist model that you, that you, um, find attractive is more like the Nordic model and less like the Venezuelan model because socialism as an ideology or uh, as a way of organizing uh, the resources and the means of production of the society, it's not one size fits all. And, and, and you have catastrophic failure right beside so-called success. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, socialism as a system is not the answer if it goes down the path of Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, just to point out a few more facts on um, the Nordic countries that uh, they, their countries uh, were economic successes before they built their welfare states. A lot of people don't realize that it was the actual wealth that um, allowed the luxury of the, uh, the generous programs that followed. So that, that's uh, one fact. Another one is... Um, uh, a lot of people don't realize is uh, they don't have minimum wage laws in the Nordic countries. N none of the Nordic countries have a minimum wage law. Um, another fact is in Sweden, um, they have complete school choice. So uh, whereas your, your property taxes may go towards uh, government uh, schools only in North America, there's a choice in Sweden so that um, you could actually apply uh, th those funds instead to even go to a private school, to a, to a private run school, uh, if you think that's better uh, for your children, so that a lot of people don't realize that. Um, but yeah, the um, the result, though, I mean, is is it all uh, bliss? Uh, not necessarily. So if you look at what's happening now in the Nordic countries, uh, there are problems, uh, maybe not as bad as uh, Venezuela, but. Um, uh, in, in terms of the, um, uh, there's increasing uh, racial tension, ethnic tension, uh, especially from a lot of uh, new recent migrants uh, that, that are looking to uh, capitalize on, on, that, uh, the, on that welfare system that they have in place. Uh, uh, they've also suffered recently from uh, the, the oil revenues that uh, go in mainly to Norway and Denmark, so that, that hasn't been as good. Um, and a lot of people uh, don't realize uh, in many of those areas there there's actually the highest consumption of antidepressants in the world. So that that's a fact that um, is, is quite amazing as well. Um, and then even recently, what they've done is is moved to um, uh, to do certain activities which uh, a lot of people are not aware of in terms of uh, uh, strong movements now to cut taxes. Uh, limit public benefits, uh, reduce welfare spending, uh, pension savings have been partially privatized, uh, for-profit forces have been allowed in the welfare sector, um, state monopolies have been, have been opened up. So th there's a lot of change happening even in the Nordic countries. Right. Those are excellent points. And it goes to show that, um, that what we're really talking about is not a purely economic system, that, that the socialism in, in whatever flavor we're speaking of is a social system and a cultural system. It's not simply a financial arrangement. So um, 
I, I just to kind of speak, uh, change gears a little bit and, and um, go through some slides I, I have about um, the social welfare um, model of, of spending on infrastructure um, and public spending as, as sort of like a way of, of distributing the, um, the wealth of the nation, right, more broadly. Then, then, uh, and so I have a, a slide here of infrastructure. Everybody loves infrastructure, right? And it's a very politically popular way of, of, of creating jobs and distributing uh, resources. And so we see that uh, globally, China, of course, has spent huge amounts of their capital on, on infrastructure, you know, and we all know that they have high speed rail and, and subways, and they've gotten a lot of, of, of public benefit as well as jobs from their infrastructure. But at some point, you've already built out all the subways you need and all the high-speed rail, and then, then you wonder, well, what, what do you spend the money on next if that's your social welfare uh, program, you know, building infrastructure? And here in the U.S., um, it's, we're, it's well known that um, the U.S. infrastructure is aging in many ways. The water, uh, electrical systems, roads, and so on all need uh, more investment, and that can be seen as, as – um, a productive use of public money. In other words, at least the public is getting some broad-based value and jobs are be being created as opposed to just giving money away without any strings attached, like universal basic income. And then um, to show another uh, failed way of, of distributing funds, uh, we, I, I have a chart here of, um, of uh, higher education student loans in the U.S. And of course, we all know that there were no such things uh, prior to the like the 1990s, and now there's um, about 1.3 trillion dollars of student loan debt, which is guaranteed by the federal government. So it's it's um, it's a form of socialism that ends up uh, turning students into uh, debt serfs. So, um, and a lot of people are saying, well, we need to forgive all that debt, but um, that debt was um, issued by for-profit firms. And so we have to be really careful when we uh, talk about socialism, like who's, who's um, skimming profits from um, these government programs. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, and so, um, and then my, another, my last slide here is, is showing that state and local government expenditures, which tend to be um, the, the most, uh, you know, boots on the ground or the, the, uh, the most, um, visible forms of social welfare spending tend to be state and local. In other words, um, infrastructure on, on local roads, um, local welfare, local uh, school districts, and so on. And we can see that all in the U.S., the state and local government expenditures have soared f at a rate of expansion far beyond the actual GDP, the, 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 um, the domestic economy. And so then we start wondering, well, how are they spending so much more money than the economy is creating? And then the answer is, of course, we're going very deeply into debt. I mean, local governments are, are selling bonds, and, um, and globally you can see the tremendous expansion of, of government debt as well as corporate and household debt. So if, if, we're, if we're funding all of our social welfare and infrastructure with debt, then we're, then we're creating another issue that doesn't have anything to do with socialism or capitalism. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the debt, the debt will, um, is, is uh, creating a lot of imbalances and, and could bring down the entire economy. So uh, people, don't, people always love infrastructure and they love social welfare and they like the government spending more money, but where's the money coming from? And what, right. what are the consequences of, of using debt to fund social welfare? Yeah, essentially putting the burden on uh, future generations increasingly with with the increase in debt. Uh, yes, as, as the result. Um, yeah, and uh, and then some would say, well, maybe we should just uh, tax the income on on millionaires. But uh, there's actually a fact that if you even put a hundred percent tax on income from every millionaire in the U.S., that would only fund the U.S. government for four months. So that's that's quite an uh, amazing fact. An another one is that even if you confiscated the entire wealth of America's 537 billionaires, that would not be enough to fund the nation's budget for even one year. So wow. there's, there's simply just not enough money out there, but there's a perception that there is. 
Yeah, that's a very good point, Richard. I believe the, the federal budget is um, pushing $4 trillion a year, right? I think it was $3.7 trillion. And so that's a, that's a big chunk of money. And, um, and so I guess we're kind of coming back to the question of what's the downside um, or the risks of pursuing um, a socialism? And um, I think if, you, if, you, if you're going to follow the classical socialism of the government taking ownership of the means of production, then you risk um, gross inefficiencies and cronyism, mainly insiders basically pillaging those, um, those assets uh, to their own benefit and then um, impoverishing the nation by underinvesting or malinvesting the state money. Yeah. Uh, that's that's one danger, and then in 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 the Nordic model, you've described that it's not um, it may not be affordable. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. As as revenues decline, then then you uh, then even prudent governments end up starting to borrow money and living off of asset bubbles as a way of generating their revenues. So that's a danger. And then the the U.S. model of just borrowing trillions to pay for infrastructure and social welfare programs, that, that creates a, a really great risk of a currency collapse or a, a loss of, of faith in the entire financial system. And I would go further to that if you look at the history of, of socialism and, and the, uh, the evolution of it in, in particular countries. Uh, generally, there's a, a very strong decrease in the standard of living that ultimately results in brain drain and wealth drain. So uh, you get to a point at, at some point where it's, it's nonlinear. Uh, a lot of people begin leaving, f- looking for opportunities elsewhere if they're educated. Uh, wealthy people don't sit there uh, as sitting ducks. They're, they're likely to move uh, at some point um, with their, together with their wealth you know, to somewhere else. Uh, so that that's also um, you know the potential for for that to happen brain drain and wealth drain. Yeah, and and, and my last point, Richard, would be that you know socialism, like capitalism itself, um, however you want to dis- define it, they it tends to work much better when things are decentralized, when power is decentralized, ownership of assets are distributed, and people have a say, both as consumers and owners, and so. My example here is water systems. Uh, in other words, um, if, if uh, in, in, in very localized uh, places like a city or a county, public ownership of water has been very successful because um, the agency's localized, they're owning specific assets in the community and the community is democratically organized so they have a say about how that, that resource and asset is managed. And they can vote out the board if the board is corrupt or, or incompetent. And so a socialism on a very small decentralized scale can work very effectively in protecting or, or uh, you know, public assets um, in the same way that capitalism really only works if, there's, um, if competition is, is allowed um, to thrive. And, and, and so we're talking about when, when things are at very large scales like, uh, and centralized power, then you get rid of competition and you also get a, you usually get rid of the benefits of, of, of actual public ownership of assets. Mm -hmm. And I think overall the majority of millennials um, have not uh, been able to understand how and why uh, there was a financial crisis back in 2008, 2009 and what the role of uh, the federal reserve and central banks in general has been uh, in causing that, uh, as well as in causing uh, wealth and and income inequality um, from uh, various central bank uh, activities and central bank policies. We've covered that a lot in in prior podcasts, uh, how and why that happens. Uh, So I think that's been also a major driver for uh, the millennials to, to, uh, to sort of misinterpret, misunderstand what's happened and, and therefore go to uh, uh, maybe bad conclusions, if you will. No, I think you're absolutely right, Richard. The financial repression of zero interest rates and, uh, you know, quantitative easing for the, the banks and so on. Yeah, that, that's what's uh, disrupted and uh, the, the, the opportunities and um, 
created the inequality that uh, the millennials want to resolve. And we understand their desire and, and uh, the, uh, the justice of, of, of resolving those inequalities, but it's the, how do we do that? And um, if we're going to pursue uh, the Nordic model, then what we're really talking about is then you need a you need a, a a market economy and a cooperative government and um, and a and a cultural milieu that supports fiscal prudence and and uh, and wise investment of resources, not just like throwing money away and giving it away and yeah, exactly. borrowing it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, this there was also um, a recent study uh, I I saw where it was pointed out that the minority of radical leftists are actually dominating the Democratic Party agenda. So th this is interesting because between the Democratic Socialist Party of America and um, and the traditional Democratic Party, which is now having their agenda. Um, controlled or, or dominated by radical leftists, this is quite uh, disconcerting, you know, in terms of uh, what could happen uh, for, for the potential for extreme socialism in America. Right. And again, um, we're, what we're trying to elucidate here is that it, um, there's there are models of, of like private or public ownership of assets on a small scale, like I said, that, that have a long history of functioning like public ownership of the water works. But um, what's being proposed is not really classical socialism. What it's, what it, it, it lends itself to free money for everybody. And if we have to borrow the money, then fine, you know? And so that's not really socialism and it's not um, classical socialism, nor is it the Nordic model that um, so many people look to as, as a successful model. Yeah, exactly. And we're essentially in general agreement uh, to conclude um, as some final words in terms of what, what could uh, make sense. Uh, so we don't take sides on any parties, but uh, politically, but uh, generally we, we see uh, uh, a more limited government approach that is decentralized uh, with, with minimal uh, special interest group uh, lobbyists, if any at all, that, that, uh, that lends itself from a centralized uh, form of government as being optimal, right? Would you not agree in terms of that approach? Yeah, absolutely. That a planned economy is a failed economy. That's really what we're talking about. There, you know, a planned economy means insiders benefit, and it's lost to all of its adaptability, flexibility, and efficiency. Exactly. And uh, what what do you see uh, as potentially evolving uh, uh, as a final question to consider in the in the coming years in terms of? Um, the evolution of, of uh, where uh, America is going? <laughs> well, that's a big question, <laughs> Richard. Um, yeah. and, and, and certainly people um, are, I think people are struggling to find some sort of answer to rising inequality and the concentration of wealth and power. And they haven't really come up with anything. And so they, a lot of millennials view socialism as the answer. Um, and other people view like reforming the government so that there's less cronyism and, and, and so on. But I don't think that, um, that they're going to get the results they want from those kinds of, of policies. You know, I think we need um, a radical decentralization of power and a radical redistribution of opportunity. And that's going to mean breaking up all the cartels that are, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically state uh, managed cartels which control most of the US economy so and, and get rid of the financial repression that we've described it's totally centralized and it benefits centralized wealth and power great uh, insight Charles we'll end it on those words of wisdom how how can our <laughs> listeners learn more about your your work yeah, please visit me at of2minds.com and you can uh, read the first uh, couple chapters for free of my new book, uh, Money and Work Unchained. Excellent. We'll end with you. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you, Richard. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only. 
and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 